Well, good morning, everybody. So excited to be here with you. Happy New Year. Man, it is so cool to see you. Some of you I haven't seen since last year, and it is, is that, is that joke getting old by now? <laughs> hey, uh, we are so excited uh, on this day, the first day of the year, to be talking to you about living a life on purpose. Everybody say purpose. In fact, if you would grab your notes as we prepare to talk about that. We thought it would be great this year to begin the series by talking about what are the fundamentals of a life well lived. How do you know that you're living after God's will? You know, it's funny. As a pastor, over the years, people have asked me questions like, how do I know I'm doing God's will? How do I know what God's purpose is for my life? Anybody ever have that question? Everybody has that question. There have been books written on this question. I want to tell you that God has not made this difficult. It may surprise you to know that God has spelled out in his word very, very clearly what his purpose is for every human being. That while there are distinct purposes for each of us, because we're all uniquely made, God has called us all to the same five things. In fact, we have these five things in this particular worship center. Uh, We don't have them at all of our campuses, but in this particular worship center, our Milburn campus, we have those five things posted on our wall. That is worship, and evangelism, and discipleship, and ministry. You guys guys get the idea. There are five purposes that God has called us to. And he's called us, so every week we're going to be spending time talking about what are the five purposes. And to kick off the first purpose, we thought we'd just talk about who has our heart. Who are we worshiping? And I thought there's no better person to talk to us about worship than our worship pastor, Pastor Kyle. You know, we believe in this so much, we even staff on purpose. We have five purpose pastors that cover evangelism, discipleship, ministry, fellowship, worship. You get the idea. And, uh, and so Pastor Kyle is our pastor of worship. So I'm going to have him come out, kick off the message as he introduces us to this concept. Let's hear it for Pastor Kyle. <laughs> okay. Well, good morning. Happy New Year. Man, you guys are glad to be at church. That feels good. Well, um, yeah, I get to uh, just have the privilege of leading our worship and creative staff here at North Point. Um, I love it. I feel like it's the dream job. Um, People who love the Lord and people who love art and just the overlap of those two things is, uh, it's the best. I love it. Uh, But, you know, even more than the artist and what they create here at church, the thing that I really love is uh, just seeing people offer their life to God in worship. Um, and uh, if, you, if those words mean anything at all to you, uh, you just know uh, the thrill that it is to live for the Lord. And uh, so today, I'm just excited to be able to spend some of the first few minutes of, uh, of the year talking to you about this. And, uh, and I really want to help you think about the purpose that God has for your life. And I want to start doing that by uh, talking to you about the thing that is at the center of your life. And, uh, and help you see that, that, that it should be Jesus, honestly. I know that, um, that that's a pretty personal thing to say. I know that uh, with our culture, it's very off-trend for me to tell you what should be the center of your life. Uh, but the Bible is just, uh, the truth of the Bible is just so clear. That your life needs a center of gravity. That you were created needing something to center you. And uh, the reality is that for all of us, you have either found something and committed your life to protecting that and building your identity around that, or you're just spending your life with a deep sense of longing. A lot of us live life with a deep ache, um, looking for purpose and acceptance. And here's why we need a handle on the purpose of worship. Because worship is something that you're already doing. And you will continue to worship forever. Um, Your life is centered around something and it's the thing in your life that matters more than anything else. And it's, for most of us, it's probably something good, like your career, or financial stability, or raising kids that are well-mannered, or trying to make your spouse happy. And none of those things are inherently bad. But I'm, I'm sorry to say that sooner or later, these things will fail you. If you have built your life around your career or your marriage or seeing your kids make good choices or you're following online, whatever it is, 
The day is coming where that thing is going to fail you. And if your life is built on them, the thing that's going to happen is that your life is going to fall apart. And the reason for that is that God's created our world and he's created us to have Jesus as the foundation of our identity. He's like the operating system for our life. And everything else in life by design is destined to fail because it was never designed to bear the weight of your life and your purpose and these questions that we wrestle with. And I really believe that uh, in the issue of worship, you are not gonna be able to see what's missing uh, apart from the help of the Holy Spirit. I really believe that it's something that the Lord reveals supernaturally to us. And, uh, and for that reason, I just wanna pray together. Would you pray with me for a minute? I just wanna pray for you that the Lord would speak today. So Father, would you just give us eyes and ears uh, to hear from you? God, would you show us the better way to live with you at the center? And in response to that, God, would you help us to just offer everything to you in worship? Um, yeah, we pray this in uh, just the strength and the power of the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So all month, we're tackling these big questions about our purpose. And uh, the first one I want to start with today is this question. It's an age-old question. Why am I alive? What is my life about? And why am I here? And uh, the answer to this question shows us what we, what we need to know about worship. And uh, the Bible teaches that your life is a gift. It was given to you by a creator, and that creator has a purpose for your life. And part of that purpose is that you would live your life enjoying God, enjoying the life that he's given you, and that you would offer that back to him in worship. It's like this, um, a father, who, who are the dads with a daughter in the room? Anybody else? Yeah? All right. It's like a dad that uh, gifts his daughter with a new car or a used car or whatever. This gift can be used a thousand ways, right? Uh, giving a gift, uh, my kids are pretty young, so that's a terrifying idea. Uh, but the idea of uh, entrusting a car uh, to your daughter and allowing her to use that gift as she sees fit. And she's now free to come and visit dad at work. She can drive to school, she can take a trip, um, and in a way, the gift of this car is a picture of grace, right? It's a picture of the life that's been given to us. Bought with a price, but freely given. And with that gift of freedom comes the risk of mistakes and misdirection and danger and all sorts of things. And in the same way, the daughter chooses to respond. The way that she chooses to respond shows us the freedom that we're given in worship, right? Right? She gets to choose what to live for. She can choose to use this car for the things that her dad would want her to do, or she can, for better or worse, use them as she sees fit. But the choice that we make in how to live our life is the choice that we make to worship. Whether or not you're already living for God today, however it is that you're using the car that he has gifted to you, I'm here to say today that the best choice that you can make for your life is simply to cooperate with God's purpose for your life here on earth. To cooperate with his design and just to begin to move in the direction of God's purpose for you. And that you would begin to live a life of worship with Jesus at the center. So let's, let's do this. Let's answer this question. What is worship? Good place for us to start, right? If you are new to church, and uh, if you are, welcome. Super glad that you're here today. The word worship for you probably brings to mind uh, some scenes from Indiana Jones, right? The golden idol. Uh, people wearing robes, maybe speaking a weird language, chanting something that you don't understand. Uh, if you're a church person, if you're a believer and you find yourself at church often, I would bet the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word worship is singing or music or praise. Because I ask that question of people almost every week. And those are the only three words uh, that people typically have come to mind. Um, but to say that worship is music is as incomplete as saying that to be a family means that you play board games together. Or to be healthy means that you drink a protein shake every day. These are things that help us pursue relationship and health and worship. But we need a better definition than that. 
And the answer of the Bible and the answer of this text that Megan read for, for us earlier, Psalm 95, is that worship is the act of giving ultimate value to something in a way that energizes and engages your entire being. That's your first big idea for this morning, that worship is the act of giving ultimate value. And we worship all the time. It's what we do with our life. Every one of us is doing. It's as natural as breathing. And God, in his grace, has, has given each one of us the ability to choose what we worship. But you can't not worship. You have to worship something. Question of you, but just by a show of hands real quick. How many of you, if I asked you right now, could tell me about your dream vacation? Okay. How many of you, if I asked right now, could tell me uh, what you hope to do with your tax return in a couple months? Okay, a couple more. Where are our retirement people? Who's planning their retirement already? Yeah? That's an exciting thing. And how many of you, honestly, when I asked that question and something came to mind, how many of you were moved emotionally by the thought of what you might do with your plans? See, that's because we've been created to worship. What just happened just a moment ago for some of you is that your life, for a moment, was engaged and energized by the thought of something good, the thought of enjoying your life in some way. And that's because we have been created to respond and to be engaged by the object of our worship. But today... On the first day of this year, the thing I want to do is just encourage you to center your life and your affections and your hopes and your dreams on something that won't fail you, something of true worth, and that you'd become committed to choosing Jesus in every moment of your life. I mean, you're here, you're sitting in a church service only, you know, 10 hours, I guess with time change, maybe 12 hours after the ball dropped in New York, right? So uh, that tells me that you're either bored or you're superstitious, uh, or you're at least a little stitious, uh, or you're here today because you want to spend today and this year engaging the things of God. And this year, I bet you're hoping to engage more of yourself in some way, right? The resolutions that we make. We want to better engage our finances or our health or our time, right? And that's what worship is. It's choosing to engage with the Lord in every part of your life and submitting every part of your life to him. And that's the picture of worship. It's engaging God not just with our voices, not just an hour one day a week, but with our entire being. And that's the answer to our next question. And the question's this, what happens when we worship God? And the answer to that is that worship, when we worship the Lord, worship engages and transforms every aspect of your being Mind, will, and emotions. And if you know your Bible at all, right, you know that the call of Christ is to love the Lord your God with your heart and your soul and your mind and strength, right? We see these words in the gospel and in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, but we see it also in Psalm 95, right? Verse 1, we're called to worship him with this emotional language. Sing, shout, extol, right? The Psalms are filled and the New Testament is filled with commands to be thankful, right? Filled with commands to not feel afraid. This is emotional language. Verse six, we're called to worship him with our will, the language of cooperation, of volition, of our choices, right? Our faith's a physical faith. It's not enough to just believe. We're called to come and kneel and bow down. And friends, uh, if you're a believer, these things are not suggestions. These things are commands of what it looks like to live a life that worships the Lord. Verse 8 has the language of mind, right? Thinking and reason. It says, hear his voice, listen to his voice, and accept what he says. This goes so far beyond an intellectual faith, and it moves us to places of being willing to humble our lives and say yes to the things of the Lord. In other words, this text shows us that worship is something that engages our entire being. It's not enough for you. If you if you want to be a follower of Jesus, it is not enough for you to simply under, to know your Bible and to understand God on an intellectual level. 
It is not enough for you to show up and sit in this room and feel feelings and be moved and stirred emotionally. It's not enough to go through the motions of religious activity and join a team and attend a small group. It's more than that. And here's why we need more than that. Here is why we can't afford to see worship as an option for some Christians. As something that young people do or passionate people do or the artists do, right? Remember, it's not about music. It's about engagement. It's about transformation. And that transformation is deep. And it's deeply needed. Because apart from the Lord, we are in bad shape. Look at this. uh, Colossians 2, uh, verses 12 and 13 on your outline. But look at verse 13. You were dead because of your sin. And because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. But then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all of your sins. Amen. Man, isn't that good? Yeah. You, you've, you've heard us today talking about, about baptism, right? That's what we're getting ready to do in a few minutes. My friend Ryan's going to be baptized. Man, if, you, if this verse is moving you and you want to know what it means to be made alive with Christ, you can do that today. You can do that today. But you and I have a deep need for transformation, for resuscitation. We were gone. We were long gone and needed to be brought back. And that's what happened on the cross, right? And this bringing back to life can only be experienced when we truly worship and engage our whole life. It doesn't work. If you're trying to compartmentalize your faith to a certain time of the day or a certain time of the week, this part of my life, these behaviors, these are for the Lord, And then these things over here are separate. If you're trying to live some sort of karma balancing out of life, friends, it's going to fail you. And this is how so many people, even people who claim to follow Jesus, live their lives. They claim to love God, and then they live their life completely disengaged from the things of the Lord. And then they're surprised and they're angry that God hasn't transformed their life. Crisis strikes in their life. Their life falls apart, right? 2020 showed, showed us what happens when life falls apart, right? And how many people did not have the maturity, did not have the faith that it took to navigate through that because they'd short-circuited their faith by not engaging with God. Knowing about God is not the same as walking with God. And he's called us to so much more. To spend your life knowing about God is completely different than actually knowing him. And look, it's possible. I mean, the Bible is full of people. Um, There's been times in my life where I can get really good at doing Christian things and not at all know who the Christ is. Knowing who he was and where he lived and what he said and being able to quote Bible verses is not enough. It's not the same. The kind of transformation that we're talking about comes from walking with God and learning his voice and learning to say yes quickly. How many people know, uh, know who Michael Jordan is? Raise your hand if you do. Not a trick question. All right. Now, how many people have had their life changed by Michael Jordan? I don't see any hands. How about this? How many people have had their life shaped by their father? That question answers itself, right? Because even even a, a father who's completely separated from your life shapes you. Friends, God doesn't want to just shape your life a little bit. He wants to engage and transform your entire being. That's why it's why he went to the cross. We have some friends uh, who opened a pottery studio uh, last year, recently. And uh, as I was thinking about this, working with clay, who's worked with clay before? High school, college, whatever, just for fun, yeah? When you work with clay, you finish the process by taking it and baking it in a kiln, right? And the process of that firing, is what they call it, transforms clay into ceramic, right? Right? And that's a picture of our life. God gives us clay, right? He's put breath in our lungs. And he, in his goodness, has allowed us to shape our lives. But many of us never hand it back to him to be fired. 
we get caught up, we get so caught up thinking about how life is about us and what we want and how we want to shape it. And we forget, we get so caught up in that that we forget to offer it back to God. And the act of offering it back to God is where the transformation happens. And in that process, our lives become something beautiful. Something eternal. Right? God begins to transform us. And our lives become useful and we find our purpose. And there's nothing like it. When we earnestly engage with God, he gets a hold of every part of our life. And we begin to see why worshiping rightly is the only way to live. So, why should we worship Jesus? How do we live a life of worship? There's one step, and you're going to do it over and over and over for the rest of your life. And it's your last fill-in here, or your next fill-in. Uh, we do this by choosing to put Jesus first in every moment. Putting Jesus first in every moment. This is simple but not easy, right? Quickly, uh, why Jesus? Why not someone else? Look at verse three. Uh, the Lord is the great God. He's the great king above all gods. In other words, in faith we're trusting that Yahweh is the better, he's the better way, right? Of all the things that we could pursue in life, of all of the people that we could devote ourselves to, he's the only one who's not gonna fail you at some point. He's the only one who's ready to handle the weight of your mistakes and your sin and your duplicity. And he's the only one. And he, man, it brings him joy to love people like this. In the highs and lows of real life, he won't fail. Counterfeits will though, right? We talked earlier about th those things that, that want to compete for the center of our life, right? Um, a healthy body, a comfortable income, a great glass of wine, all of these things can do an incredible job of moving us towards moments of worship, right? Of saying, Father, thank you for this moment that I'm in. Thank you for the thing that you've put in my hand. But these things in themselves are terrible objects of worship. They're like counterfeits. They appear valuable, right? They work sometimes, but they're bound to fail you before long. How about this? Who thinks that you could go out and uh, spend a counterfeit $100 bill. Anybody? Yeah, my man. I like that. Now, how many of you think that you could go out and you could spend a counterfeit $100 bill every day for the rest of your life? Different question, right? You guys have to wait for your tax return. Um, <laughs> here's the deal. Just like a fake $100 bill, these things pretend to be more, more valuable than they really are. And our lives get centered on these things when we're not careful to stay engaged with the Lord. And without knowing you, I would imagine that for most of us, there's not some big monster competing for, for your heart in your life. I mean, maybe um, there's a chance that for some of us in a room this big, there's some acute part of your life that's just completely out of control, right? It's alcohol, it's debt, it's an eating disorder. And if that's you, let me just say this. This year is the year where you can surrender that to the Lord. This is the year that you can find freedom from that. And the good news is that it's not too messy for him. You're not too far from home. But I would bet more times than not that for most of us, the thing c competing for the center of your life is you. It's pretty basic, right? It's this desire that we have to be comfortable and to feel important and to have our way. It's you putting yourself first in every moment, right? At least for me. Uh, man, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> As our worship pastor the thing that's in the way of me living a life of worship is me. It's my response to my kids. It's my response to that person that won't turn off their turn signal, right? <laughs> it's my response uh, when the Lord asks me to be patient, right? 
Shane's gonna come and he's gonna teach more. He's gonna give us some next steps of how to live this out practically in our life. But I wanna do this together. Uh, I wanna end this part of the message just by reading God's word together. Uh, this is John, uh, John chapter 15. It's maybe my favorite passage in the whole Bible because I, I don't know of more beautiful language to illustrate a life of worship. So let me read this. But as I read it, would you just listen for the voice of the Father? Would you listen for the Holy Spirit as this is, uh, as this is read? <laughs> Jesus says this to his followers. He says, you must remain in life union with me. For I am remaining in life union with you. For as a branch severed from a grapevine will never bear fruit, so your life will be fruitless unless you live your life intimately joined to mine. I am the sprouting vine and you are my branches. And as you live in union with me as the source, fruitfulness will stream from within you. But when you live separated from me, you are powerless. Man, what a word. Shane, nice. it's all you. you. Guys, I got to tell you, I feel so honored to work on a staff with such talented pastors and uh, people that love Jesus so much. You know, this putting Jesus first, this making him the center, this thing that he just read about remaining in Christ, this is a challenging thing to do. You know how many times you go through the Bible and you see it say something along the lines of pay attention, take heed, watch out, be careful. Jesus says remain in me. Listen, he wouldn't have to say it if it weren't challenging to do. The reality is, is that things creep in. It's easy to let other things become the center of gravity. We get restless, we get hyper, we get worried, and we so quickly want to move God out of God's place and bring something else in. So all I want to do in the last few minutes of this message is give you four ways that you can get skillful at worship. And I want you to begin to apply this over the next year. Okay, again, we're going to be talking about all the purposes of God, what God has called you to, by the way, let me just say, another by the way, is that as we go through these, if you were to ask me, what does a healthy person look like? What does a healthy Christian look like? I would say, a healthy Christian looks like the five purposes. If you begin to practice these things in your life, and you're diligent about them. By the way, if you study revival, when God has moved upon people groups, you will find that when God's spirit moves on people, you start to see these five things in operation. And so, it's no wonder that we want to begin by talking about worship. Now, how do I put Jesus first? Remain in him. Number one, write this down. The first thing that I need is community. I need community. Now, Psalm 95 it is so obvious that you miss it. One of the most important things about this psalm, you'll notice, if you just look back at your notes, is that it's all in the plural. Go ahead and look at the front page of your notes again. It says, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let, what? Us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Come, let us bow down. Let us kneel before our Lord. He is our God. We are his people. See, here's the reason the psalmist puts it this way. Because we worship in community. Do you know that? We worship in a group. Now that is not to say that you're not supposed to be good at individual worship. No, I encourage you. Have individual worship. Have individual prayer time. But this is very important. I would tell you as best as I can understand, I don't know if I could make a real case for this, but in, in all the years that I've been a pastor, I can say that I really believe individual worship is really preparation for corporate worship. Corporate worship is the real transforming experience, but what we do individually prepares us for that. You say, why? Why do you think that's so important? Well, think about this for just a minute. God himself is a plurality. There's not just God. There is God the Father, there is God the... And there is God the... God himself is made up of a community. He means for worship to be a community thing. Not only is he made up of a community, and because we're made in the image of God, I don't even think we can understand him perfectly, except that we're worshiping together. 
But you know what he says? He says multiple times, Jesus said in the scripture, that if you're coming to worship him, and you remember that you have a problem with your brother or sister, that they've sinned against you or you've sinned against them, he literally says, leave your sacrifice at the altar and go and get right with your brother or sister first. God says, you can't worship right with me if you're wrong with them. Worship has to happen in the context of community. Many of you have come in today and you're harboring unforgiveness for people. You've come in today and you said, oh, I'm so mad. Some of you have come in today, you literally you stepped out of the car, calling your wife or husband names, and somebody said, how are you? And you said, oh, we're good. We're, we're doing just fine. Yeah. But, you know, you're yelling at dad. You're yelling at grandma. You're upset with one another. God says, get right with each other. Then you'll be able to be right with me. That's why Jesus said, yes, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. But he said the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, friends, listen. Everything that I'm saying to you right now, it goes against the Western, consumer, individualistic understanding of spirituality. See, our idea of church today is, well, I'll just drop into church I'll just drop in over here, but mainly I have my own spirituality. I don't really need the church to do it. I'm telling you, you will never know God as you should unless you're doing it in the context of community. Second thing that you need, write this down. That, by the way, that first point, I, I'm just going to say this is the reason why you should make church attendance a priority. Do you know that the average church attender, they go 1.35 times a month? I don't know how they get to the 0.35. <laughs> I don't know how statistics are done. But can you believe that average church attendance today in America is just a little over one time a month? That's unbelievable. Now, I'm not saying how often you should assemble, and believe me, I'm not going to come to your house and call you a backslider if you miss a week. I'm just going to say to you, though, you've got to be worshiping in community. Now, here's the second thing I said we'll get to. second thing you need is truth. Write that down. I need truth. If you want to get better at worship, you've got to have truth. Now, let's go back to Psalm 95 for just a minute. How does the prophet know that God is the great God, the great king above all gods? How does he know that? He writes that. You can see it in the psalm there, Psalm 95. How does the prophet know that in his hands are all the depths of the earth and that the sea is his? How does, the, how does he know that he's a shepherd? How does he come to think of God as the great God, the great king above all gods? I'm going to say this to you. Here's how he knows it. This person writing the psalm has submitted to what the prophets have said about God. This psalmist has submitted to a body of truth. They, this psalmist has said, the scripture is the self-revelation of God. And listen to me, by submitting to the truth and taking it in, you're able to look at the truth in God's word and say, now let's look at my life. Now let me do an inventory. Let's use it. That's how worship becomes life-changing, because you're submitting to truth. And that's how you have a transforming experience. Now, by the way, everything I just said is not something skeptics like to hear. Even progressive Christians don't like to hear this. What I hear people saying to me today in America is the average person says something like, you know, oh, this is what I call Oprah Winfrey spirituality, okay? It's, you know, I'd love to have something spiritual in my life. I'd love to be a part of a community. But I just want to kind of design my own religion. Now maybe you don't even think that overtly, but you do covertly. I want to create my own religion. And God, well, I don't like this part of the Bible, and I don't like this part of the Bible. But, oh, but I do like this part. But, you know, I also like this part of Shinto. I also like this part of Buddhism. I, and so what you've done is you've piecemealed your God together. I'm just going to say to you, if you do that, go ahead. It's a free country, but I'm going to suggest you're going to have two results. First, the God you're serving is not the living God. The God you're serving is a cardboard cutout of yourself. 
And if you design a God that fits you, if you throw out the scripture, if you're unwilling to submit to the scripture, what are you going to have? You're going to have a God who can't fight with you. You're going to have a God who can't argue with you. You don't need to measure his word up against your life because God conforms to you. You don't conform to him. Don't you see? You're full in yourself. You have a God that will never outrage you. You have a God that is not alive. Your God is dead, if that's you. Now, I want to say to you, here at North Point, the beginning of the year, because we know people say, gosh, I really want to begin to do my life differently, and I want to change my habits up. And I just want to say, we give you all sorts of tools to do that. This year, uh, to help you get into God's Word, we have a prayer journal that are on sale today. You can pick those up today. We have... uh, a place to take notes when you're reading through the Bible. We have multiple Bible reading plans, chronological Bible reading plans, topical Bible reading plans. You know, because we're going through the purposes, we're, we have for you uh, uh, at our guest services the book, The Purpose Driven Life, which will cover all five purposes if you've not read this. The point is we're giving you all sorts of resources today to begin submitting yourself to a body of truth and saying, God, how does my life measure up to that? that make sense? you got to be willing to submit yourself to that body of truth. Now, here's the other thing. I said you'll have two results. The first is you're going to have a God that doesn't argue with you. Here's the, here's the second thing you're going to have. You're going to find if you worship a God that you've made up, you've made it impossible to really be in community. You've made it, imp- let me say that again. You've made it impossible to be in real community. You know Why? Because by creating a God that looks like you, you've isolated yourself. Why? Because nobody serves the same God that you do. Now here's what's so cool about serving the living God. If I listen to the prophets, if I listen to the apostles, if I listen to the scriptures, and I listen to what they say about God, do you know what that means? This is so cool. That means that I could meet a Nigerian Christian woman who is totally different from me. She could be racially different from me. She could be culturally different from me. She can be economically different from me. But in spite of all of those barriers, when we talk about Jesus Christ, we are a community. That's why. Now you start making up a God of your own design. You start piecemealing God and saying, well, I just like this and I just like this. You've just isolated yourself. You've got to be willing to submit to the same body of truth that everybody else does. Now, here's the third thing that you need, if you just write this down. You need the Spirit. You need the Spirit. Now, I want to say to you in Psalm 95 that we're looking at today, the word Spirit doesn't show up anywhere. However, it does tell us this. Look what it says. It says we should come into His presence. Come, let us sing for joy. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord. Now, by the way, when I say it talks about coming into the presence of God, for a skeptic, that's hard. Because what they'll say to me is, Pastor, why are we talking about coming into the presence of God? Isn't God everywhere? And I just ask you, is God everywhere? Sure he is. But let me tell you about the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will make you very aware of the presence of God. In other words, it's the Holy Spirit that helps you to sense the reality of God. That makes God palpable. He will be present. You can almost feel him present in his power. Present in his grace. Present in his majesty. In John 3... Jesus told a theologian named Nicodemus, he said, the Holy Spirit is like the what? Does anybody remember? He said, the Holy Spirit is like the wind. Do you know a Christian who's skillful at worship, you know what I think of him? I think of him like a sailor. Because let me tell you something about sailors. Sailors can't generate the wind. Sailors can't create wind. But sailors are skilled and all set up that when the wind comes, they can catch it. And they can sense when it comes. And they're prepared when it comes to ride the wind. And to go where it takes them. And a person who's skilled at worship, because they submit themselves to the Holy Spirit, they can sense when God is doing something and they can go with that. 
You know what it means to be a skilled worshiper? What it means to worship well? Well, you need to be able to do it in community. God is a community. God says, if you're not right in community, go get right. Then come back to me. Number two, you need truth. We've all got to be submitting to the same body of truth. You've got to get into God's word. You've got to start practicing the habits. Third thing I said, you need the who? You need the spirit. By the way, people say sometimes, we're going to do a series on this down the road, but people say to me, what does it mean to be filled with the spirit? Well, I just ask you, the Holy Spirit is what? A person or a thing? The Holy Spirit is a person, is a personality. You ask me, what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? I'll just ask you, what does it mean to be filled with a person? What does it mean to be filled with a person? First time I met my wife and I fell in love with her, I got filled with her. What was that like? Well, I started centering my life around her. I started giving her attention. What does it mean to have your life filled with a person? Anybody ever have a new, ba anybody ever have a new baby? What does it mean when your life gets filled with that person? It means you're willing to stay up late at night, doesn't it? It means you've fallen up. It means that you're willing to change poopy diapers you never would have touched. Ever. Why? Because your life gets filled with a person. What does it mean when your life gets filled with God? It means that your whole life, again, Pastor Kyle talks about the center of gravity. That your whole life orbits around him. And everything that you do. Now write this down. What do you need? Last thing and then we'll be done. I'll give you this. What do you need to worship well? Write this down. You need to experience what I call gospel rest. You need to experience what I call gospel rest. Now, this is very confusing because you go to the first part of this psalm, Psalm 95 again, and it's really good, it's really upbeat, and it seems obvious. But then all of a sudden, did you notice it got really severe? Let's look at the scripture. He says it's about, you can look at it just on your notes, it's about, you know, three quarters of the way through, and, and the psalm shifts, and it says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as you did at Meribah, as you did in the day of Massa in the desert where your fathers tested and tried me, though they had seen what I did. He says then in verse 10, for 40 years I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray. They have not known my ways, so I declared an oath on my anger. Let's, let's just say it together. They shall never enter my rest. Now, let me ask you this question. Why would... You end a psalm on worship on such a negative note. Why would you do that? Why do you think the psalmist has done that? Well, let me give you a little tip. Write down next to the psalm, the little scripture reference, Hebrews chapter 4. Because the writer of Hebrews actually talks about Psalm 95. And he gives us the answer. In fact, the, the Hebrews writer makes a big deal about how Psalm 95 ends. He says... The psalmist is saying there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. But then Hebrews asks a question. And again, read this later, Hebrews chapter 4. Here's what Hebrews asks, a logical question. If it's really true that Joshua got the people of Israel to the promised land and they did experience rest, why is it that centuries later, Psalm 95 warns, be careful that you may not enter his rest. In other words, if Joshua has already given you rest, why is it telling you to be careful that you're not going to get the rest? Let me just put this in a nutshell. What this means is, is the physical rest that the children of Israel experienced must be pointing to a deeper rest that you can miss. It must be. In other words, God's saying, it's not physical rest I'm talking about. There is a rest of the spirit that you need. What would it be? The writer of Hebrews calls it the gospel. Let me tell you what the gospel is. Are you ready? The gospel is not a theology. The gospel is a historical event. It is good news. Something took place in history. Listen. Jesus Christ came to earth. We just celebrated his birthday. Don't you love the baby Jesus? We just celebrated his birthday. Jesus Christ came to earth. Jesus Christ lived the life that we could not live. He died the death that we deserved. 
And just as God rested on the seventh day from his work, so in the gospel we can rest spiritually from our good works. Let me tell you something. Religion says... If I live a good enough life, God will bless me and I can rest. If I have a perfect record, God will bless me. But the gospel says, Christianity says, God gives us in Jesus Christ a perfect record. You can rest. All you have to do is receive it by faith. And your ultimate rest comes from trusting in the gospel. If you believe the gospel, you rest from your works spiritually. You don't have to live up anymore. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to do everything right. Guys, look at me for just a minute. Some of you, you're going to make commitments to be baptized today because you want this to be a new year. I think that's a great decision. It is symbolic of an internal commitment that you want to give your life to Jesus. Man, that's awesome. But I need you to understand, you will not be perfect after your baptism. You are going to struggle you are going to sin. And God will not be surprised by it. God knows everything that you're going to do. What I expect you to do is to be able to say, because I am in Christ, I am forgiven. And you trust that by faith. And although I'm not where I want to be, I ain't what I used to be. And God and his spirit has filled me and he is transforming me. That's what you're resting in. Now, do you realize whether you're religious or irreligious? You could be here and you'd say you're not religious at all. I got to tell you, you're still working. <laughs> Listen, if you're religious, you're working because you're a moral religious person and you're trying real hard to be good so that God will bless you. <laughs> but if you're an irreligious person, you're, you're trying hard anyway. You know why? Because remember Kyle said, what is worship? Worship is ascribing ultimate value to something, and everybody's doing it. Some of you are trying real hard to be cool. Some of you are trying real hard to be savvy. Some of you in, are trying real hard to make money and be successful. Some of you are trying real hard to be pretty or handsome. I try real hard to be handsome. Look, it doesn't get me anywhere. You realize underneath all that trying and working is a current of deep insecurity. And what you're saying is, if I were really good enough, if I really work hard enough, then I'll know I'm somebody. I, th I always think of Rocky Balboa. Rocky 1 is the greatest movie. Rocky 1 and 2. goes downhill from there. But I all, am I right? Come on. Amen. Man, you've never been that lively on a movie. That's good. Rocky 1 and Rocky 2. Those are great movies. And, and what's he saying when he's fighting Apollo Creed and Mickey wants to throw in the towel? Rocky looks over at Mickey and he says, don't you dare throw in that towel. Don't do it. Mickey's like, why, Rock? Why are you going through all this? Why are you going to do it? He says, because I got to know I'm not a bum. Some of you, why are you going through all this? Why you do everything that you do, it's because you're trying to prove your, to yourself that you're something. God says, you have to learn to rest in me. I completed the fight for you. I did it. And that gospel gives you deep and final rest. He already loves you. And he accepts you in Christ. Are you enough? No, you're not. <laughs> you're not enough. In Christ are you enough? Come on, that's good theology. Let's try that again. Are you enough? No. In Christ are you enough? There you go. So whenever you hear those songs where the worship leader's saying you're enough, just go, in Jesus, you're enough, you know. Change that theology just a little bit. And just know God loves you. You want to start the year right? Let's pray that we get our worship right first. And we're going to talk about the other five things over the next several weeks. Sound good? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for every man and woman here. Thank you, Jesus, for your great work in their life. Thank you for your great work in my life. Lord, I just pray that you'd help us. Help us to be the people that you've called us to be. I pray on every campus 
wherever they're seated. I pray for folks that are seated in Kerman. I pray for folks right now that are just up the street at Bullard. I ask in the name of Jesus you'd touch them right where they are. And for those that are in this worship center or online, God, would you bless them? And we pray this prayer. And you just pray this with me from your heart. Jesus, I want you to come into my life. Be my king. Be the thing I worship. I ascribe ultimate value to you and you alone. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I am a sinner. But I give my life to you. In Jesus' precious name. Everybody said, amen, amen. Doesn't it feel good to pray? <laughs> Say that to God. Now, guys, a couple things I just want to remind you, a couple faith steps. What's the first faith step you can take for this first day of the year? Number one, pick up the tools that are going to get you some good habits to start reading God's Word. Get a Bible reading plan. Get a prayer journal. By the way, we engraved it. It's the North Point Prayer Journal if you want to pick this up. Um, and it's a new one that we're starting to use this year. It's cheaper than the ones we used to. If you like the old ones, you can order that directly from them in your old prayer journal. Just go to the back. It'll tell you where you can do that, but we have these for you. Um, I would just say to you, also, if you're not familiar with the purpose-driven life, pick this up and read it as we go through this series. If we run out today, order it on Amazon and start reading it as, as soon as you get it. Sound good? And let's just be talking about these things. Now, if you want to be baptized, let's do it. The water is jacuzzi warm. And uh, it's going to be good. I know people are already planning on being baptized. I'm trying not to baptize a lot of people because I've been battling a cold. Uh, but I do know there are a couple of people that said they want to get baptized, so join them today. But there will be pastors ready to baptize you. God bless you. Have a great morning.